So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, there's been a lot of news in, in the co-working world coming out about uh, partnerships with these big box retailers. And um, it was neat how um, that one space in Boston, a uh, uh, work bar with Bill Jacobs partnered up with Staples. And how many times have you, have you guys been to one of those big box retailers like Office Depot and Office Max? Office Max is gone, right? Pretty sure. Yeah, pretty, kind pretty, of. It's it's on again, off again, on again, off again. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't uh, kept up with it, but yeah. Yeah, we lost him. Um, yeah, so I've I've heard of of kind of conflicting opinions as far as uh, you know uh, how this this relationship with the big box retails is going to work. What's what's your opinion on it, Amanda? So I'm curious what the conflicting opinions have been. Well, I've, I'm, and I'm basing this off of comments yeah. on Facebook primarily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people saying um, there's already no vibrancy in these types of spaces. Is co-working really going to, you know, kind of change the environment and the culture in these spaces? Is it, is it a real thing? Is it going to harm it? Or should it have been done the other way around where actually co-work, where they're bringing in the retail shops into the actual co-working space instead of the other way around, right? Got so it. that we're picking up on the vibrancy. That's kind of, you know, the, yeah. the kind of battle yeah. of opinion that, that yeah. I picked up on. Yeah. Well, what people don't know is there's actually kind of different levels of, of staples and, and some of these big box real retailers. So there's the retail divisions and kind of the online division there that's kind of known for leading with supplies, but oh, they also have furniture. And there's also um, other divisions like business interiors by staples, um, which is a division that focuses on um, contract furniture. So bigger projects, um, companies that, um, you know, want to work with one specific rep that you're not, you know, putting this together yourself, you're getting very, very high quality stuff you're getting kind of ushered through with a um a rep that knows the industry sometimes they work with architects and designers not always um, they tend to be kind of stuck in the middle so between what you would consider you know a true contract dealer that's with one aligned manufacturer um and the supply world so there's kind of this this in between almost like a continuum of who you can work with in the contract furniture market i didn't know that that makes a yeah. big difference yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Um, I published an article and um, we'll have to send out the link here. I think I can live tweet it here, but um, about it's called Dear Furniture Industry Love Coworking. And um, it was really talking to kind of a lot of people in the inner co-working realm um, about some of their challenges and getting set up and getting furniture in the in their workspace. And um, and then talking to some furniture dealerships that are, you know, true contract furniture dealerships um, like Henriksen in Chicago was one of them that I interviewed for that story. And um, it was amazing how little each side knew about one another. You know, co-working is really trying to get in, get started up really quickly, doesn't want to spend a lot for startup costs, um, but for traditional furniture in the contract realm and the way that it works, there's a lot of intricacies with um, cost and financing and kind of how they have to do things. So um, it was a great learning for me about, you know, some things that each side of the industry could probably learn from one another. Yeah, some really great spaces are also shown. I actually printed it out. I still like to print out my articles. Oh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so much easier to just kind of absorb it for me instead of look at it on the screen. Awesome. Um, what, what is your take on kind of like the, because one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, there's the, these space owners, they're coming in and they don't always kind of have like, you know, the, the capital to be able to invest in, in some of um and make these types of expenses for some of these furniture options. Although for those of those that do, I mean, there's some really great options. What, what would you recommend for the, the do it yourself, you do it yourselfers out there? Well, I mean, it's, um the do it yourselfers so not everybody has the budget to work with like a design firm right you don't have the budget to bring in somebody who you know to really gut your space and redo it although there are design firms that work at all different levels so you can find somebody that'll work with you you know just to help you something as simple as choosing paint colors and things like that so i guess that's my first piece is that you don't always don't always be afraid that you have to cut the designer out there's different budget level, budget levels for that um second is that a contract dealer um you know what their focus is is the uh, service model so they really focus on, they know furniture, they're experts in furniture, and they can come in at whatever budget level that you need and really help assess your space. Um, their design services are included from the standpoint um, that they do all the specification and help you with the furniture ordering and installation and things like that. They're there as a service partner to really take a lot of that burden off of you. So um, if you're a true do-it-yourselfer and you're really literally thinking IKEA furniture, that can be done. 
Um, absolutely. But um, just think about, you know, the time involved in that and kind of what the trade offs are, um, because there's certainly some quality implications. You know, you're going to be ordering that all yourself. You're going to have to figure all of that out yourself. This is not your expertise, most likely. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can do this, but is it um, you're the one who's going to have to assemble it. You're the one who's going to have to design it. You're the one who's going to have to think through all those measuring things. And as simple as it might sound, it, it ends up being a lot more complex than you think. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, we when we opened up um, kind of co-working, it was kind of like a half and half deal, right? So we worked with with a designer, but then as we didn't think of it all, right? And as like different members started coming in and had different needs, we were picking up different pieces. And one of the things that um, most of our members decided to integrate to was the ergonomic concept. So we worked with a local designer and they brought in these are really amazing desks. But then later on, we decided that we were going to integrate an option for them to put ergonomic legs on them. So their desk could move kind of like up and down. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. also um, worked with a, a, another local dealer who had a move free and I'll share their really great concepts. I have their link right here and they offered like these stand up computer desks that everybody really loved and, and were super affordable. So that's not something that we brought in, but something that, you know, a local vendor was able to uh, bring into the space that a lot of people really loved. Um, right. See some more of the move free products there. Um, do you see th that that type of trend happening in, in a lot of the spaces? Yes, um, definitely. I mean, in the industry as a whole, not not even just co-working. You know, one thing that's happening is, um, you know, a lot of the space used to be de dedicated to just individual workspaces and um, and that was it. So think of desks, you know, and, and in a traditional office, 80 percent was kind of this heads down workspace and 20 percent was meeting rooms, conference rooms, things like that. And now we're seeing that in forward thinking workspaces move to 50 50 or in some cases even 60 40, which with much more of the space um, being dedicated to collaborative areas, shared spaces, um, some kind of alternate furnishings. And that is actually having a huge effect on our industry in terms of even how furniture is specified. So um, a lot of these dealerships, for example, are hiring ancillary specialists. Um, you can imagine as, you know, w when it was mostly desks and cubicles and things like that, the specifications would flow through their internal designers and they were educated on typically one mainline product. But now these specifiers are having to be educated on a whole lot more products because the breadth in that ancillary area is getting so broad. So a lot of these dealerships are bringing in ancillary specialists. And what those ancillary specialists are um, in place to do is be an expert on all those things you're talking about, these height adjustable desks, these alternate pieces that are really helpful, maybe bringing ergonomics into the workplace, stuff like that. So it's their job to be up to speed on absolutely everything that's out there, where to get it, who's easy to work with, what those warranties are, you know, who's great about customer service and who's going to take care of you from a manufacturer standpoint when something goes wrong. And so, you know, that's another reason I just highly recommend um, getting that dealer involved because that is their expertise. And in the long run, um, they're probably going to save you money because they're going to, you know, <laughs> get you the right product in the first place. They're going to use all that expertise that exists internal to them. Um, and they can really work with some different um, price points too. Yeah. A lot of saving of headaches and times for sure. And the, and the assembly, I mean, I can't stress that enough. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there's so yeah, many and things there's, done um, there's some fun. new, um, there's some new models coming into place too. So um, one thing that we're seeing, and I have an article coming out next week in an industry publication called Office Insight. So that will post to um, Huffington Post probably in a week or so um, that's talking about this residential trend that's hitting our industry. So um, even contract commercial interior designers are starting to specify things from like CB2 and West Elm and um, some of these other places, which um, to our industry is very shocking because we're um, nervous about quality, right? Um, so you, we want you to be with manufacturers that are that products going to last you for a long time. Um, and from a lot of smaller companies, startups, um, even some of these co-working spaces, there's kind of a mentality of, I don't know where I'm going to be in three years. We may be growing this space. I don't have to pay to move this. So it's almost um, like a disposable mentality, you know, like we're, we're just going to use it for this period of time and then we'll be done with it. But what happens at it, with it at the end of that? Um, almost flying in the face of lead and some of the sustainable um, um, I guess, strides that our industry has made in the past few years. And so um, there's one company um, called Swivelfly, another article that's coming out very soon. So um, um, Swivelfly is a company out of California. It's based in um, the Bay Area where there's a lot of startups and things like that. And they started just kind of seeing this trend and saying, we've got to do something different here. 
Um, and so it is an alternative to leasing furniture or renting furniture, which renting tends to be very expensive. You might as well buy it. Uh, at least you'll own it at the end. But um, Swivelfly is introducing furniture as a service. Um, and this furniture as a service is basically they're matching it up with your lease. And in general, in the industry as a whole, leases are getting shorter. They used to be in the realm of 10 years, and now on average, they're three to five years. So leases are getting shorter. And that's one reason I think that this residential trend is hitting. Um, and people are looking to this furniture that may not last 20 years, because if you have furniture that lasts 20 years, you're going to have to move it to all your different places. So this furniture as a service comes in and says, um, hey, you just use it for as long as you want. And then um, we come and we pick it up. And um, the way that they've structured their pricing, it's a much lower initial capital investment. And then you just pay a monthly fee, almost like software as a service. So you're paying for your licenses to use certain software and things like that. So it's a really innovative new model that's happening in our industry. Wow. That's and they just launched, they launched a month ago. So they're brand new. That makes great sense. <laughs> that's that's yeah. definitely mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So as far as like furniture and what should be included in in every space well what, what do you think about that i mean what what are the essentials <laughs> for this movie? yeah yeah i mean everybody wants a magic pill right and um i would love to be able to give you a floor plan and say do this and order these five pieces of furniture and um this is exactly what's going to function for your space but um each of these co-working spaces is so unique right and and we can learn from some commonalities in them um but it's very difficult to say this is exactly what each place should do so um I, um, I think I sent you in advance, you know, I looked at some cool products that I think are cool for um, co-working spaces. They may or may not work for your space. Um, you know, you'll have to kind of figure out the personality of your space, the design of your space, the feel of your space, what you're trying to create there, who's working there, what kind of work they're doing before you can really say. But um, I picked out kind of four products to talk about that that are, um, I think, notable in terms of co-working spaces. Um, so one is um, through Allsteel. Um, and All Steel um, was my former employer, so um, I still um, love that company. And I think they're really leading our industry in terms of making collaborative space really fun. Um, so they have um, Gather, uh, Gather Collection, and there's um, they've got quite a few names for this one kind of common spaces um, collection. But um, if you go to allsteeloffice.com and look at their public spaces and lobby, you'll see some, oh, there's a link out there now. Um, you'll see some really great um, um, options there. Um, another one is a product by KI called Connection Zone Privacy Booth. Um, and this is, um, it's kind of a tube shaped chair with a cutout in it. Um, cool. So you literally kind of sit into this um, little cutout and you can swivel it around. And it's bizarre um, because the minute that you sit in there, it's got acoustic material um, kind of surrounding it. So if you're on a private phone call, you can literally kind of just sit down in this chair, swivel it around, and it really kind of deadens the, the, the sound around you. You can't hear what's around you and people can't hear you as well. So, um, you know, for someone who's trying to use space efficiently, maybe you're not building in a ton of those little phone booths that you can, you know, have hard wall, dry walled in. Um, this is another alternate. Um, the third one is um, a series by a company called Newcraft. Um, and Newcraft has this 246 series of um, meeting room furniture. So it was really designed around this theory of um, most meetings are not happening around huge boardrooms, especially in spaces like co-working. So the average meetings are either two, four, or six people. So a lot of them are height adjustable. You can really um, kind of move around. They're flexible. You know, meeting rooms now double as conference rooms, both in the corporate realm and even in a lot of these co-working spaces. Maybe it's um, somebody's renting an office. So this conference room is now a um, an office, but a month from now it's going to be. Um, um, a meeting room and the same table needs to be repurposed from a desk to a meeting room. So this 246 collection really gives you a lot of flexibility, mm -hmm. height adjustable, um, you know, flexibility around that. Okay. Um, and the fourth one um, that I put in here, um, another company called Gent, G-H-E-N-T.com. Um, they make a lot of, they really explore the dry erase realm. So um, they make a series of whiteboards. Um, they actually have the first powder coatable whiteboard. So it's um, metal coated. You can bring great colors into it. So um, those products just launched and they have really great line of glass. So they just came out with some new um, colors. So um, it's really exciting um, to kind of look at some of those and just explore how you could use some of those products. So those are just four ideas. Um, but um, we do have our industry trade show um, in June. So um, that's in the second week in June every year. 
And um, <clears throat> and that's a really great place to kind of come if you're looking to really understand what the furniture realm has to offer. Um, um, that's a great place to kind of get educated on the uh, the industry and what else is happening there. So if anybody, you know, we can get a group together, I'm happy to do a tour. I'll be there all three days. Sure. Um, Where, where's the conference? It's in Chicago. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. At the at the convention. At the Merchandise Mart. So oh. the Merchandise Mart in Chicago, downtown Chicago, huge building, has its own zip code. Um, the furniture mecca of the world there. Really? How many people attend the event? So I want to say it's like ten thousand people, something like that. It's so a very large. Yeah, event. it might be. Wow. It might be even bigger than that. I might be misquoting yeah. that. So I'm sure Chris will get a link up there for for everybody. Yeah. So all this being said, um, which spaces? Um, around the nation or around the world have you visited that you admire for their design? Wow, you know, most of my co-working interviews, well, let me back up a minute. So um, I really got in, involved in writing a lot about co-working and researching this for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, I work with, my consulting business is built around um, furniture manufacturers and um, those surrounding the contract interiors industry. So um, wall covering manufacturers, furniture manufacturers, things like that. And um, our industry as a whole is starting to look towards co-working and say, what is going on there and what can our industry learn from that? And I even had um, a good friend of mine, Cheryl Durst, the pre or COO, I think, um, CEO of um, IIDA uh, come to me and just said, you know, we really want to understand what we should be talking about. So I was asked to speak to the IIDA board of directors about what's happening in this co-working trend. Um, and IIDA is the International Interior Design Association. Um, so these are heads of major firms around the country um, just looking to say, what should our industry really be learning about this? And so I started reaching out to a lot of um, different co-working spaces and just visiting with them about, you know, what they've learned about their space, what they've changed about their space, what they like about their space, what they don't like about their space. And that is what um, resulted in that series in the Huffington Post and a few other industry publications uh, about co-working. And um, a lot of people in my industry are just really kind of interested in this and, and learning from this. And and I think what's interesting is um, co-working takes the the concept of workspace to the consumer level. You know, you become a consumer of workspace. So you use it on demand when you need it. You're paying for it. So unlike a workspace where you have to go, um, you're becoming a consumer of workspace. So I think when we have that level of choice, there certainly is something that um, that we can learn from that. So um, that being said, to answer your question, most of my interviews have been over the phone and interviewing owners and operators about you know their spaces and what they've learned. So I've seen a ton of beautiful pictures, but um, I can't say I've been in all the facilities that that I've interviewed um, simply because it would not be possible to travel that much and <laughs> get the whole series out. Um, but um, certainly learned a lot in that. And you can um, go to my Huffington Post um, blog link there and um, see a lot of those articles where they're republished, even if they were started in another uh, industry publication. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for sending all those links as well. Um, let's see. Let's try and see if we can get some of our members to join us here today. Um, for those of you viewing us here today, you can jump on and take this open seat and um, ask Amanda any questions that you might have about your individual spaces, um, whether you're considering starting a space or you already have a space and you know how you have some lingering thoughts or you know you want to ask for some recommendations um, this is a really great opportunity for you to do that now so um, as far as the the different sizes of of the individual spaces right i mean co-working spaces started off being pretty small and now you know you see all, all types of different um, hybrid of spaces each with different needs, you know, according to the to the um, customers that they serve. But for the smaller spaces, like the 1500 to 3000 kind of square foot spaces that um, are really tight, um, I hear a lot from those spaces that they're the ones that are, are really struggling to kind of make the best of small spaces. And at the same mm -hmm. time, you see a lot of people wanting to stay small and minimize their spaces and that sort of thing. So some of the furniture that is out there um, it may not necessarily serve that. What, what have you seen that that would help um, these the, the smaller type spaces? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's something everyone's struggling with, right? Because real estate is such a big spend for every corporation or small business. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it's one thing that I'm seeing a lot of development on is that it seems like in our industry, um, everything is going multifunction. So furniture today doesn't have just one function. You know, it's a desk that can double as a meeting room <clears throat> table, as I was talking about with that new craft series, that new craft 246, you know, um, you know, it's a pedestal. It's a, a small storage file that has a pad on the top that you can kind of sit on it. Um, and see that. And, you know, even uh, at Neocon last year, there was a company called Vitra um, who did this whole concept. And, and I'm not, um, it looked like a concept. It didn't look like it was first full flushed out to me, but um, it was very interesting. So what it was, it was a, um, a full desk that could fold up. So picture two doors kind of fold out and then a piece folds down, it becomes a desk. And this piece could be um, height adjusted. So it could go all the way so low that you and I could sit on it together with a couple of throw pillows and it was comfortable as a lounge seat. It could go to standard desk that. height, like 29 inches. So you could work with that as a standard desk or it could go up um, to a standing height desk, which is how I prefer to work. Um, and um, this whole demonstration at Neocon, they had these um, young men dressed in all black. And at certain times of the day, they had a big calendar on the wall that would um, kind of um, show when this was going to happen. These dancers would come in and do this choreographed dance routine and literally reconfigure the space in its entirety, um, set to music um, within like 20 minutes. And the funnest oh, thing wow. about that was just to see people's, I mean, people don't get that excited about furniture and people <laughs> were like clapping and smiling. And um, so it was fun in concept and in theory for these companies, you know, especially smaller companies that are looking to, you know, just be more uh, flexible in how they work. Sure. Can we take some time and talk about just kind of like the office chair and then we'll sure. come back in and talk um, to Chris a little bit. So there are so many options when it comes to office chairs, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we went with about five different types of office chairs, the office chair for the conference room and then the office chair for the people and then individuals want to bring in their own office chair and then they're asking for programs if they're available, you know, for at a discount when they want the upgrade. Um, how what type of office chair should people get, right? I mean, how yeah. low on that pricing, on that pricing scale should should they be investing, and what should they be expecting to spend per chair? Because I know personally, that's that's always a conversation to be had. Um, it, it was had when when uh, Jenny started her space over at Cahoots when we were, you know, opening up Connect, and then later on, now that Jenny's expanding, you know, out into Midtown and Cahoots, it's 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 another conversation. Like, what is the mm -hmm. right chair for for these types of spaces? Yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard because a chair is such a personal thing, you know, and you might be um, housing, you know, a five to 100 pound soaking wet female to a 300 pound male um, or female, you know, who knows, like um, this day and age, we're kind of um, having to um, hit a broader breadth of weights and sizes and what's comfortable for her may not be comfortable for him. Um, and so some companies are starting to go, I, I mean, this has been happening in the furniture industry for a while. There are sizes, so you can have the same look of a chair that's in A, B, and C size. Um, so some chairs, like the Aeron chair is one that's very well known that does that. Um, your challenge with that is just inventory and how do you know you have the right mix of those? Um, this is where that furniture as a service model becomes really interesting because what if you could just let people choose, you know, and you could bring in a bunch of chairs and you could rent them based on the people there. Um, and what they prefer and what they like. And even, you know, in these large corporate projects, when people are buying seating, buying furniture, you know, they typically want one standardized uniform look. So they have people come in and um, we, we used to lovingly call it like the butt rodeo because you come and do the plop test and kind of sit in it and, um, you know, see, see how it feels to you. Um, we also encourage people to borrow them and most contract dealers will do this for you is um, to send them and sit and work in them a day because when you plop down in a chair, um, it feels very different than how it's going to feel if you're actually working at that chair. So um, I guess my advice is, <clears throat> you know, maybe go to um, that size model if that's available to you. If that's, you know, if, it, if having that consistent look is really important to you, that's one idea. Um, the second would be just to try those out and, and make sure that your members try those out. And if you want that consistent look, you're going to have to probably vote. You're going to make some people unhappy. Or the other option is maybe you pick a standard color palette or a standard fabric or something like that. So even if you're ordering different chairs, um, the contract industry is really known for um, um, its custom furniture, you know, so you could take the same fabric and put it on, you know, chairs from 10 different manufacturers. And maybe that's a way to kind of make everyone happy, but still get a 
a cohesive look. That's great advice. Let's uh, take some of these um, questions for Chris who couldn't who couldn't log on today because of uh, technical reasons. But he's saying, "How do you make a room of stand up desks look pretty when they're all different height?" <laughs> <laughs> That's a great right. question. Right. Well, and I would say, um, you know, it is what it is. So these different height desks are going to be, you know, they're going to look different heights. Um, but most of the co-working spaces that I've set foot in, you know, are not really this polished, pristine um, look anyway. Um, you want them to be um, to look lived in. You want them to look well loved. You want them to look like this bustling hub of activity. So I guess in my view, that's that's not um, that's not a bad thing. Um, and we do, you know, in a lot of corporate offices, you know, they have cleaning folks or admin people or something like that that come in at the end of the day and lower everything to one common height, even, you know, like chairs in a conference room, something like that, just so when you come in in the morning, it's like having your bed made, everything looks fresh. Um, but I guess I see those different heights as a indication of activity and healthy people working and, and the kind of community you want in your office. Fantastic. How many of these pieces do you see um, or have you seen when do, with your interviews and the research that you've done uh, that establish design standards for people coming in, right? So kind of like prevent um, if you are going to be bringing in your own chair or you are going to be, you know, adding certain elements and stuff to your desktop. Uh, do you see people establishing elements and do you know of, you know, do the, do, can the local designers help you kind of establish some of those standards so that when you walk in, even though they are kind of casual active spaces, it doesn't end up looking like a flea market? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say, you know, most of the larger corporate offices don't allow you to bring your own stuff in. Um, that's still, if you're paying, you know, for a designer to work with you on your space and you're trying to create a branded look in your space, um, most of them just kind of put the kibosh there. Um, but it is it is a challenge for a lot of workplaces too. You know, do you allow the guy to bring in his Beanie Baby collection and, you know, <laughs> pollute his beautifully designed workspace with that? Um, and that's something I feel like every... Um, Every corporate office kind of has to come to their own um, office policies and, and agreements uh, on that. Okay, let's take another question um, from Chris and say, do you see any interactive uh, lead surface tables coming to the offices, or is it, or is it still too back to the future? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm working on a piece right now that's the the 10 trends um, that we'll see over the next few 10 years. Um, and that's for HP is creating this new uh, microsite where they're, um, it's going to be very technology rich or very content rich and focus on kind of Gen Yers. And um, so this is an ebook I'm actually writing for them. And so it's really um, kind of exploring a lot of the um, the technology and the integration with all that we talk about in workplace and kind of what's coming. So um, I can't say that I feel like we're going to see LED surface tables <laughs> coming, but um, there sure is a lot of interesting things um, coming in terms of technology and what's happening. Um, one company that I've um, recently interacted with a lot is a company called e -Ink, Um, And they actually, they make... Um, they make this screen for like the original Kindle. It was originally developed by a bunch of MIT students who um, wanted to make an electronic screen that had the readability of a newspaper. So it's actually um, ink that um, you electrify and it sends you know one color to the front or one color to the back. And um, so the nice thing about this is it's very low power. Um, and it's reflective and not emissive. And it's really kind of hard to explain, but um, it gives you the readability of a newspaper. Um, once you switch it, it stays on. So like that old Kindle screen, um, once you switch it, it stays on and it's using no power, but you can still see that image on it. So um, e-ink is bringing this to the architectural market with a product called Prism. And this Prism product will create color changing space in the workplace. But again, it's reflective, not emissive. So it's almost gonna be like, um, it's almost going to be like a uh, paint that changes color throughout the day. So you could, you know, flip the switch, whether it's, um, you know, motion activated, something like that, you can flip the switch and it will change. So it's really um, going to be interesting to see how products like that kind of affect the built environment and the designs that these really creative designers are able to do. Amazing. All right, let's take another question. Um, the active desk. Do you think that these are just fads or... Um, how long do you think that people can actually walk on a, <laughs> on a treadmill desk during the day? <laughs> yeah, um, so it's funny. I think that the treadmill desks are a little bit too literal for me. Um, um, and maybe that's just because I still wear heels um, when I'm in an <laughs> office typically. Um, but I think the, the thing that is coming is this concept of active design. 
Um, and um, there's a great white paper out by KI, um, which is um, looks at um, active design and how to incorporate that in your office. Um, so the studies show that even if you're a, a regular, uh, you work out regularly, um, if you say do a half hour run in the morning and then you sit for eight hours a day at your desk, which could be even longer if you think about it, because you're sitting, you're driving to the train station, you're sitting on the train on the way to work, then you walk to work, you're sitting in your desk, maybe in front of your computer for eight hours a day. Um, by sitting, you can actually um, undo all of that work that you did in the morning um, health wise. And there's all of these articles saying sitting is the new smoking, <laughs> et cetera. Um, so this health and wellness trend is huge in our industry right now. It's it's everywhere. I think at Neocon, that big trade show I mentioned this year, we're going to hear more and more about health and wellness. So while I'm not sure that everyone's going to have a treadmill desk, I do feel like this sit to stand concept is going to be everywhere in the future. And it's going to be a standard. It's not going to be something you have to ask for. Um, already in our industry, the, the prices of those kind of products are coming down because they're becoming so proliferate. Um, and um, you may have heard of like the lead standards, which is kind of the sustainable environmental standards in our industry about being um, about green design for buildings. And there's a new standard called Delos, D-E-L-O-S, the Delos Well Building Standard, uh, which is brand new, but it's backed by a lot of really big names. Deepak Chopra, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is behind it. Um, and I think that that Delos Well certification is going to be kind of the the evolution of building sustainability into human sustainability, which a lot of people in workplace and in our industry are really um, looking at now. Wow. So what do you use? So um, I, well, when I'm at home, I, I work from a number of different locations. So I, um, I have an island that I work at for a while. I have a um, seated desk that I work at um, and I kind of move around almost like a co-working space. I move around depending on the different tasks that I'm doing. I even have a, a screen and porch, which is my favorite place to work. So um, when I'm out there, I, um, you know, work in the outdoors, which is the best way to me. What's the what's the most wild piece that that you've seen? And I'll show you. And it's actually part of the the Move Free collection um, that I had talked about earlier. And I don't even know if he has it up on his website quite yet. But um, he did a TED talk here in Tucson on his concepts and what it was. It was like this super bulky. I mean, it was a prototype still, right? So it was like this yeah. super bulky chair that you would um, lay into it. And as you lean back into it, your laptop was like right here, and it was like working your core all day. So you were kind of leaning like this and and moving around like this and working your core and like you got an equivalent in an eight hour day of like running a marathon from being in this oh my thing. gosh you feel ridiculous in it right so yeah you're leaning back like this and when you're leaning back you feel like you're gonna fall and and you know and it's so it's gonna take some adjusting for people to kind of get used to not being at their desk and hovering over that being said what has impressed you what what type of you know um concepts have you seen that have blown you away that you're just like, wow, that's really cool. But yeah, would I be able to use that? <laughs> right, right. You know, I don't know, like as far as really far out stuff, most of the far out stuff to me, I'm like, mm, I'm not sure that I can really see that, you know, some of these phone booth products that are, you know, like furniture pieces that sit in an office are a little weird for me. Some of them are a little bit bulky that the way they've done that. Um, there's some really interesting chairs that um, are designed to promote movement. Um, so some of them you kind of straddle, you kind of sit on um, and it's been like um, kind of a joke in my industry. I feel like Neocon 2015 was the year that the skirt died because I feel like there's no way <laughs> that you can sit or go to an office in a skirt anymore. You know, we the, the days of the modesty panels are gone. <laughs> <laughs> the modesty panel. That's great. That's awesome. Hi, welcome. Hi, Hugo. Hi, Hugo. Can you hear us? Let's see if we can. Maybe he's not uh, looking to speak. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, he says he doesn't have a mic. Okay, so oh, got he's it. okay. Yeah, got it. Wow. Well, that's really great. Um, let's see. I think that there was one more question from Chris here. He's he's asking about footrest and uh, kind of like sitting all day, and he's like, should you have one? Yeah, I mean, to me, a footrest is a band aid, um, right? Like a footrest means your chair is not fitting you correctly. So um, if it's comfortable for you, you know, and again, if you're trying to go to the standard seating or something like that, um, you certainly could have one. Um, there are some interesting products coming up now um, that are almost like footrests for standing. So as we talk about this active design too, there's one that's almost like an unlevel surfboard um, and the name of it is escaping me right now. But um, if you think of, you know, like those pads that your cashiers used to stand on um, yeah. to keep with foot strain, 
think of it almost like that, but it's it's unlevel. So it kind of like rocks throughout the day and it's designed to kind of engage your core and engage your your movement as you go. So um, so you're not just standing in a static position, you're actually kind of moving throughout the day when you're standing. So I feel like that's kind of the footrest of the future, if you will. Amazing. Besides the uh, Neocon, what other conferences will you be attending this year? Um, Neocon is a big one for me. So there is um, Neocon East, you know, there's some great um, like little sub conferences, you know, there's some around like wellness and these well building standards. Um, um, there's a lot of um, there's Salone in um, in Italy that's coming up um, in the next few weeks. So those are on my wish list of conferences I would like to attend, but um, I have no plans to attend um, this year. But for those of you who can, you should. Yeah, <laughs> and there is, um, so there's a great um, publication in our industry that I write for that every month has a uh, complete list of all of the events that anyone on earth could possibly be interested in. Um, so if you go to bellow.press, um, Bellow Press is um, an industry publication. They just launched this year. Um, so they are the spinoff of a, a previous publication that um, Rob Kirkbride, the editor in chief, was um, the editor in chief of this other publication for a number of years and just spun off this year to start Bellow Press. So they have two publications. One is called The Business of Furniture. And that's where we as an industry kind of talk to ourselves about what's happening and try and give ourselves the best information so companies in our industry can make um, better decisions about you know, where they're taking their product development and um, their company focus and things like that. And then the second one is a monthly magazine called Workplaces Magazine. And that would be great for anyone in the co-working realm to um, kind of take a look at. And um, that is designed so instead of talking to ourselves, we're kind of talking outward, saying, here's really cool products you should be thinking about. Here's some cool events if you're looking at any of these type of topics. And that, you know, to your question about events, um, that publication has a complete listing of all the events you could be list, uh, interested in. Thank you. So <clears throat> we're going to start wrapping it up here. And so I, I would like to have you do just like a, a quick recap, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're opening up a co-working space and you don't know where to start as far as furniture. Could you give us just a, a, a quick kind of just like <laughs> breakdown on what are the steps to getting started? Yeah. So I would say the first thing is I would at least talk to a contract furniture dealer. Um, and so there are some ways that you can find them um, in your area. Um, there are six major manufacturers and most contract furniture dealerships are going to be aligned with either Allsteel, Hayworth, Herman Miller, Steelcase, Knoll, or Technion. So those are the six big ones. So any dealer that's aligned with those is going to be what I would consider a contract dealer. So um, they will talk to you. They will engage a rep with you. Um, have that conversation. Have them look at your space. So that's one place that you can start. Um, <clears throat> another idea, if you're working, you know, through a real estate company, there is um, CBRE here in Chicago um, has a new <clears throat> furniture um, advisory group. Um, so there, it's actually part of a real estate firm and they really look at how to kind of align your furniture with your um, with your real estate strategy. And um, they are trying to kind of take some of the unknown out of that and make you feel comfortable with the purchasing process and how that buying process is gonna happen. So that's kind of a newer thing. I didn't mention that, so I guess it's not a summary, but um, that's another resource I just wanted to mention. Um, and then, you know, if you're in certain markets, I would look at that swivel fly that we talked about, that new furniture as a service, because that's really interesting to me, especially with co-working spaces and how they like to work. Um, I would definitely um, think about looking there and um, um, and then Neocon, you know, um, Neocon and Bellow Press. Those are probably my other ones. Neocon is that big trade show. If you can get up to Chicago, really great way to kind of get a crash course. Um, again, I'm happy to kind of walk you through the show. Um, I'll be there. And uh, Bellow Press, that Workplaces magazine is just a great wealth of information when it comes to workplaces and what's happening and what's changing and kind of how to stay stay up on it. Okay. So what about for those who already made the purchase without having your wonderful advice or not yeah. <laughs> these things ahead of time and are looking, you know, it may not just have that extra money to kind of fill the space. Like where, where do they start? You know, how do, how do they begin kind of correcting the disaster that they put themselves in? Yeah. I mean, this is where, you know, a, a contract dealer too can kind of help you through those decisions. And, you know, they, as I mentioned before, are so well versed on product and furniture and what's out there um, that they can maybe kind of help you with um, a plan to 
kind of um, um, work through change out slowly. So maybe it's not, you're not doing a huge capital expense all at once, but kind of changing out slowly. And um, even in, in one of the articles that a link was shared, this Dear Furniture Love co-working, um, Henriksen here in Chicago is a dealer that I know well. And they um, they have even gone through some um, kind of creative um, arrangements. They're not programs, but they're individual arrangements. The one that they talk about in that article is with a company here in Chicago called Catapult, where they... Um, Catapult is really designed to be like an incubator for companies to catapult them out on their own. And so Henriksen worked with them on their space in exchange for um, <clears throat> for um, getting kind of that that first look when those companies go out on their own to be able to help them as they launch out on their own. And so I think a lot of contract dealers are becoming more and more open to these kind of flexible scenarios for these entrepreneurial companies that really have a lot of promise. That's excellent because we definitely need it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Amanda. Unless anybody, you know, I feel like everybody's been really shy. Usually we have some some windows open and it's unfortunate that Chris was a unable to jump on with us today. But these things happen. So unless someone's going to jump on, I, I want to thank you for joining us today and sharing this experience with those of us who are learning and trying to scale up and expand and do better next time. Yeah. And I will close with, um, you know, I'm really connected to my industry. So um, my website is up. It just went up today, literally. <laughs> um, so um, contractconsultinggroup.com. Feel free to reach out through that site, through my LinkedIn profile. And um, if I can't help you, chances are I can connect you with someone who will. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.